Without systematic approach, there is no science. Without science, there is no systematic approach. One who knows that science is the systematic approach to learning and working, he is the scientist. Thousands of years ago, the sages and scholars of India explored the realms of earth, fire, water, air and space. Their experiments were based on a combination of pure science and theology. They believed that science was not just experiments and research. It was about developing a way of life based on compassion, non-possession and non-violence. It wasn't a confrontation with nature, but an understanding of the natural laws that govern the universe. Their discoveries, deductions and inventions have been left for succeeding generations in a vast body of literature which include the Vedas, the Upanishads and the Puranas. The Aryans arrived in India about a thousand years after the inexplicable disappearance of the Indus Valley Civilization. There's evidence to suggest that even the Aryans had a very scientific attitude. They believed in Rit, or the natural law that governed the seemingly chaotic and diverse universe. Rit itself was divided into the Panchabhutas, or the five elements, the five factors actually. And these five factors were Prithvi, Earth, Aap, Water, Vayu, Air, Tejas, Heat, and Akash, Sky. Ancient Indian technology cannot be dated. According to a few rare manuscripts, metallurgy was one of the earliest sciences to be developed on the subcontinent. There is evidence that gold jewelry was worn in 3000 BC. Zinc was extracted from ore in 400 BC. The Agarya community of central India is said to have smelted iron since pre-Vedic times. Iron pellets are known to have been exported to Damascus along India's booming trade routes. Extraction of iron, I would not say India developed it. It was developed in West Asia. But once it was absorbed, India scaled great heights. As you know, the iron pillar has not rusted for 1,500 years. And one British metallurgist has said that till the 19th century AD, such a huge mass was not forged anywhere in, in the world. So this technique of forged welding of high purity. That is an Indian contribution of macro technology. Mirrors made out of metal. Just a small reflection of the technology available in ancient times. The technique was um, a family monopoly tradition with us. So we didn't uh, discuss the precise ratio and other mixing. Today, scientists are making mirrors and glass with the help of formulae taken from ancient texts. These texts also talk of lenses by which that which cannot be seen by the naked eye can be perceived. Was ancient India using microscopes? Ancient Indian science has to pass through the test of fire to establish its credibility. Obstacles include the non-availability of manuscripts and the difficulties in translating them. Moreover, some of the materials mentioned in them are rare or not available. Measuring units, too, are approximates. For example, the unit of temperature, kaksha, has still not been accurately interpreted. Ancient laboratories developed metals with unique corrosion-resistant properties, not just for making handicrafts, but also to create instruments and tools for further scientific research. Traditional Indian medical science's greatest contribution to the world has been its humaneness. Charaka, the founding father of Indian medicine, paints a vitriolic pen picture of those doctors who exploit their patients only for money. And he contrasts them with other medics who have a humane approach to their patients, who treat them like their father or their mother or their brother. And this is quite different, farther, than the Hippocratic Convention, which enjoins upon its doctors not to do anything wrong with their patients. By contrast, Indian medical ethics, traditional ethics, present a positive ideal to science of dedicated service. 
as their objective. Charaka asks, why must a man be healthy? And answers, because he serves his fellow beings better. The health of a society was seen to be reflected in the health of the individual. Ayurveda recognized health as being of the body, mind and soul. A way of life rather than just the practice of medicine. It was directed at preventing disease more than curing it. Ayurveda includes herbal, oil and mud baths, massages, different types of diets and meditation. There are special mantras or prayers to be recited, even while bathing, as the ritual is meant to purify both from within and without. By cleansing the body and by strengthening the mind, all adversaries can be kept at bay. Asan means he should know defense art, self-defense art. After that, he should know varma, the full fulfillment of varma. Below the hip, death is the ultimate Asan should know Siddha system of medicine. He should know minerals, metals, sulfur products, and mercurial compounds. He should know how to make medicines from herbs. When a person studies the three things, then only he is called as a Asan. Or else, we can call as a Vaidya. In the field of pure medicine, the sage Sushruta is known to have developed and used rhinoplasty. He worked with 125 kinds of surgical instruments and he performed amputations, caesareans and cranial surgeries. All this in 600 BC. At the same time, Atreya compiled the Charaka Samhita, the most referred to book on Ayurvedic medicine. Ayurvedic science as it stands is uh a very high technology science. The acceptability of Ayurvedic formulations in the Western market is an uphill task, mainly because we face questions as to the standardization of our products. Second question is the toxicological aspects involved with the prolonged use of Ayurvedic formulations. Yoga is an integral part of Ayurveda. Practicing it helps the mind attain a sense of well-being and also strengthens the body. The practice of yoga helps the psychological body to become dynamically positive, to face the tension and stress of the world because there is no accumulation or closure in the system. Born in the forests and mountains of ancient India, yoga has come of age in a stress-prone world. New Age gurus like BKS Iyengar have packaged it successfully to the West as an alternative therapy to tranquilizers and relaxants. The quest of the Upanishad, the great quest, has been the question asked in the Mundaka Upanishad. What is that by knowing which everything in the universe is known? Just like the crest on a peacock, and the gem in a snake's head, so in the Vedas is the position of mathematics. I would consider the 5th to the 12th century as the golden age for Indian mathematics. It started with Aryabhata, uh, who wrote his famous uh, volume Aryabhatiya. Weights and measures unearthed during excavations are proof enough that our ancestors were capable of minute calculations. But the genius of Indian mathematicians comes to light in the texts they left behind. Aryabhat calculated pi to four decimal places and contributed the concept of zero. Bhaskaracharya's volume called Leelavati contains delightful problems they were supposed to have been set by him for his daughter, Lilavati, and they involve trigonometry, algebra, algebraic equations for solution. 
भास्कराचार्य बारहवीं शतक के गणितज्ञ थे उन्होंने ये जो लीलावती नाम का गणिती ग्रंथ लिखा है उसकी खूबी ऐसी है कि शिष्यों को बहुत आसानी से समझ में आए उनमें कुछ रस पैदा हो इस प्रकार के उन्होंने सृष्टि से उदाहरण लिए हैं पैथोगरस का सिद्धांत हमें बताने के लिए एक मैं उदाहरण देती हूँ जो वही लीलावती ग्रंथ से लिया है एक खम्बा है नौ हाथ ऊंचाई है उसकी जिसके नीचे एक सांप का बिल है खम्बे के ऊपर एक मोर बैठा है एक सांप खम्बे की दिशा में आ रहा है सत्ताईस हाथ दूरी से हमारे सामने प्रश्न ये है यदि सांप और मोर दोनों की गति समान हो तो खम्बे से कितनी दूरी पर मोर अपना लक्ष्य साध्य करे यहाँ पे एक समकोण त्रिकोण साफ साफ नजर आता है एक भुजा है खम्बा दूसरी भूतल मोर की तीछी झपक रही तीसरी यानी कि करना उत्तर के लिए मोर की झपक के वर्ग से घटा लो खम्बे की ऊंचाई का वर्ग प्राप्त संख्या का वर्ग मूल वही है हमारे प्रश्न का उत्तर बारह हाथ द परस्यूट ऑफ नॉलेज कंटिन्यूड इन वेरियस डायरेक्शन बट एस्ट्रोनॉमी बिकेम अ मेजर इंटेलेक्चुअल प्रियोक्यूपेशन कीन ऑब्जर्वर्स एज दे वर द वेदिक प्रीस्ट हैड एन एडिक्वेट नॉलेज ऑफ द कोर्स ऑफ द सन the path and the phases of the moon the bright wandering objects of the planets the starry firmament the occurrence of eclipses and the like the king of jaipur sawai jay singh created a laboratory for the study of astronomy jay singh who built jaipur to him the sky was everything and he had two takes on the sky one was the oldest idea of the mandala the navagraha the nine square mandala which is the nine planets the other was jantar mantar which are the probably the most advanced scientific instruments of their time anywhere in the world a thousand years before copernicus aryabhatta stated that the earth revolved around the sun centuries before newton bhaskar acharya in his surya siddhant noted that objects fall to the earth due to a force of attraction by the earth the priests were considered to be the main authorities on various astronomical events and they the records show that they possessed adequate knowledge to forecast the eclipses uh, of the sun and the moon the rig veda states the sun is the attracting power of all heavenly bodies we were among the earliest to understand the uh, solar system the stars the various uh, stellar formations the rig veda also says the elliptical path through which all celestial bodies move is imperishable and unslackened suryasya pashay ashrevanam yo natandre te charat charaivati charaivati behold the sun for he is great see how ceaselessly he moves tirelessly in the welfare of man so to never drift from the path of duty keep on moving keep on moving science and theology also form the base for vastu shastra or the science of construction in the vastu shastras they have how you prepare the land for the temple you first of all flatten it out completely you cut all the trees and you have two years in which you sow a series of crops which are specified so that two years clears the land of all memory and then you start building look how beautiful these ideas are they've all got to do with starting a fresh and looking out into the non manifest world again vastu ka matlab architecture hai ye ek shastra hai jiska taluq dharti se स्थान से मकान से बस्ती से है ये मनुष्य को उसके वातावरण को उसकी कायनात को ब्रह्मांड को एक सूत्र में बांधता है हमारे ऋषियों ने इनके बहुत किस्म किस्म के 
प्लान्स बनाए मंडल बनाए अभी जो उन्होंने मंडल को विभाजित किया वो धरती की एनर्जी लाइन से किया Apart from the methods of construction, Vastu Shastra also takes into consideration the stars of the house owner and his temperament. An ancient lesson in personalized housing. The Vastu Shastra have certain aspects which are quite practical. Put all the doors in a line means that the breeze can go right through the house, etc. But it doesn't mean that the people practicing it today are following these rules. Modern cities with their haphazard growth are a far cry. from the clear planning of earlier times the mughals brought traditional beauty and symmetry into architecture each monument was a tribute to the monarch their forts were built with geometrical precision mohenjo daro and harappa were cities built for the people absolute masterpieces of urban planning Indian temples are the greatest symbols of the deep faith that inspired science. The 20 temples of Khajuraho were meant to replicate the Himalayan peaks where the gods dwell. There are nearly 500 exquisite buildings in this almost 30 square kilometer campus area of the Hampi region. In fact, Hampi has been declared a world heritage site. Science takes many forms. For instance, the science of musical tones. Devanandam ji, zara mridangam bajaye. Even today, we don't know the exact composition of these pillars, and yet they are audible proof of a superior technology. There are many other forms of science too. For instance, the science of engineering. On a desolate coastal spot on the seashore of Orissa in eastern India lie the remains of one of the greatest temples in the world, Konark, a world heritage site. Konark means the angle of the sun, and it is said that the rays of the sun pass through the dance hall, pass through the audience hall, and strike upon the face of the sun god in the main temple. Of course, the main temple has long disappeared. only the four temple remains which itself is extremely impressive the entire temple is built in the shape of a chariot with 24 magnificent wheels abul fazl the minister of the great mughal emperor akbar visited this temple and profusely admired it for its engineering skill and for its cultural marvels while other temples were sculpted with figures konark was conceived as one large sculpture Built around 1250 AD, its main tower, which was planned to be 225 feet high, collapsed before it could be completed. Myriads of figures in erotic and dance poses fill the huge stone facade with life. These frozen figures inspired the revival of the classical dance form, Orissi. Konark, like all other ancient temples. represents the whole spectrum of regional culture and is also a replica of the universal order now if i look at the architecture in, in india you take the oldest architecture the hindu and the buddhist the stupa sanchi these are models of the cosmos that means architecture has a role to play to explain to people the whole, not only the nature of their society but the whole structure of the non manifest world around them and so it is a very austere architecture at the golconda fort in hyderabad it is easy to call anyone within the vast area one just needs to clap an amazing acoustic feat which defies modern comprehension when you look at north india or anywhere in central india it's a dry 
hot climate. The architecture for that kind of thing, whether it's a, whether it's a little town or a big palace, is really to cut out the, the winds which are coming and bringing in dry heat. And, you, and uh, then you catch the air which is within the walls and you humidify it through a fountain or something. In Jaipur, the buildings there, you know, you, you've seen the, the, uh, that palace of the winds. And it's absolutely brilliant. It's like a big radiator of uh, some motor car or something. The breeze comes through and, you, and they had this uh, water dripping on the jali so that the breeze was humidified. Rajasthan, a blistering hot desert state. Consequently, living spaces, whether palaces or huts, were designed to cool and circulate air. Can these methods be revived to replace modern energy-guzzling appliances? An even older cooling system is found in the third century cave dwellings of Buddhist monks. Hollowed out of rock faces in mountains and hills, these caves later developed into elaborate sanctuaries. The labyrinthine corridors and living spaces would have been terribly claustrophobic were it not for the circulation of cooled air flowing through a system of water ducts. A simple and natural solution that combined comfort with necessity. The 12th century Spanish science historian Sayyid Andalucci gave first place to India for scientific development among the early great civilizations. His reason, India developed science with wisdom. There is a wealth of ancient literature waiting to be deciphered, waiting to be used. Vast funds of knowledge that will open long forgotten paths and restore faith and pride in our own abilities. For the seafaring explorers of 15th century Europe, India was the final frontier. The mysterious land where it was said, jeweled birds lived among trees of gold. Centuries earlier, Indian ships had already charted the seas to set up trade with distant countries. 4,000 years ago, the sea came right up to there. Today, it's all arid land. And in fact, when this site was first discovered, it was called Lothal, Mound of the Dead. Of course, Lothal, once upon a time, was a bustling port city of the Indus Valley civilization. And this dock, which still has water in it, could accommodate up to 30 ships of 60 tons each, which is approximately the size of the modern port city and the dock of Vishakhapatnam. Ancient mariners did not only have to depend on natural harbors, Artificial docks like Lothal harness the sea to create safe ports for ships. 
Lothal was obviously planned by people with highly developed engineering skills. Perhaps the earliest ambassadors from India were the fishing boats that inadvertently reached distant shores. They carried with them stories of a temptingly rich and prosperous land. It was the golden bird in search of which several explorers came. In terms of commerce, there was a long period of history when India was considered the world's most prosperous civilization. Indian spices dominated ancient trade. If the mountains of the north were purple with saffron flowers and were part of the silk route, the tropical hills of the south were redolent with cardamom and were part of the sea route. Saffron was and still is the most expensive of spices. The brilliant orange stamens are indispensable in Middle Eastern cooking and were a prized export to Mesopotamia and Persia. The green pods of cardamom flavored the cuisine of Southeast Asia and the Middle East. The fragrance and flavor of Indian spices wafted across Asia and into Europe, where people discovered the magic of pepper, cinnamon, and nutmeg. There was a time when a pound of pepper was equal to its weight in gold. Products at that time were not only commodities which are grown, agricultural produce like spices, but also very beautifully manufactured items, various kinds of gold and other metal ornaments, very highly developed pottery, various kinds of utensils made of different metals, household decorations, architectural building materials and textiles. When you think about the silks that we have, for instance, I mean, you know, every Indian designer who wants to do something luscious and, and, and extravagant um, has only to blink an eye and you have an array of silk fabrics from various regions of India. Here we are in a country that is so large, and each part of the country is developing an indigenous kind of fabric that lends itself to a contemporary designer such as myself. Once the secret of the silkworm had traveled out of China, there was no stopping Indian weavers from creating a variety of silk and other fabrics. Indian textiles have made a special mark on international fashion ramps. When Mahatma Gandhi picked up the spinning wheel as a symbol of freedom, he liberated a thousand looms in every part of the country. Traditional weaves were revived and popularized. The government-sponsored Khadi Gramudyog opened outlets in every town, giving handloom textiles a window to the world. Ongoing research and development has introduced new varieties of fabric made from jute and coconut and pineapple fiber. Indian textiles have lent their color and class to every kind of art and taste, be it on the boulevards of Hollywood or the catwalks of Paris. How incredibly influential India uh, as a country in terms of its people uh, and, and the role that it plays. I mean, you can, you can go right up to the uh, arid deserts of Rajasthan and you see a profusion of color, you know. Uh, um, women over there dress in bright reds and they decorate their clothing with, conch, uh, with little shells, cowrie shells and, and silver jewelry and the whole thing is incredible in this very uh, almost arid yellow gold landscape. And then you go to a very lush and tropical part of India, which could be Kerala, for instance, and you see the pristine quality of white as a predominant color. And I think that's pretty incredible as well. So the West is looking at things like this, and they're saying, my God, in a country as large as this, 
There is so much to play with. There is so much to pick from. But unfortunately, it always needs someone from the West to make it as popular. You take Madonna and the Manly. You take a Jean-Paul Gaultier, and, and, and you see incredible Hindu images um, on, on, on clothing. But unfortunately, it's always somebody in the West doing that. And I don't see why we as Indian designers cannot. The mechanized mills of Manchester had forced Indian looms to remain silent for centuries. Perhaps that is the reason it has taken time for Indian fabric to recover its self-esteem. But the wheels are spinning again, and the fabric that was once coveted by aristocrats of the Roman Empire is once again ready to take on the world. Uh, India had, according to uh, economic historians, at one point, 25% share of the world trade. That's a mind-boggling share. No single country today can have that kind of share. Many things went from India around the world. In a time when patenting was unheard of, India shared her knowledge without reservation. Numerical forms and the place value system, they were transmitted to the West through Arab, to the East, China, Japan, and so on, through Buddhists. And it has since become universal. Today, civilization, to a very great extent, depends upon the decimal place value system which India perfected. 5005. First 5 is 5. You agree? Then next 0 is 10. Next 0 is 100. Because of that, the next 5 is 5,000. We cannot say 5,005 if the 0 did not have any value. That is the Indian invention. Burton Russell has several times deeply appreciated that the Indians contributed zero in mathematics. And it was a profound contribution. Like nothing. With, like nothing. The idea that nothing could be a, actually be, that's how you get zero in mathematics. It wasn't just the practical. It was the fact that the Romans couldn't, didn't have zero and therefore couldn't multiply or divide, I suppose, except on their fingers. Param 10,000, a supercomputer indigenously developed by CDAC, is one of the largest computers in Asia. India as a country decided that one must mount uh, one's effort to build this technology in the country because uh, this technology was needed by uh, us uh, in a variety of sectors in both science and engineering fields and also business fields. Weather computing, seismic data processing, medical imaging, geomatics, the uses of the supercomputer are immense. And it has put to rest any doubts about India's capabilities in the field. If you look at the top 10 or 20 software exporters, you will notice that anywhere between 70 to 80 percent of the effort addition takes place from India. Every country has to recognize and strengthen its competitive advantages. Now, if the competitive advantage of India is the large number of people that it has, I think we have to learn to leverage this strength. With proper infrastructure, this strength can be harnessed to achieve global standards in manufacturing and performance. What we are gearing up to face is being able to provide people in a format of training so that these people are able to offer solutions and offer technologies, create newer technologies as far as the IT industry is concerned. Computer companies like Infosys have invested money in training students specifically for the industry. They are given hands-on experience in engineering and in software production. In a vast country like India, communication is the key to progress. From postal runners to fiber optic cables, it has been a giant leap and all in the span of a few decades. Not only can India provide you with solutions which are cost effective, on time and under budget, that's a given, but are of value to your business that is going to make a difference to your business. India is going to make an enormous foray into the next generation of software services and solutions which are going to have to be knowledge enabled and support uh, electronic business and electronic commerce opportunities. What we are finding is that the technologies which are coming will completely revolutionize the way we operate, the way we do business, and 
the way we conduct our life. The revolution has already set in. From instant money to electronic goods, from cyber cafes in villages to multi-channel local television programming, the Indian technological juggernaut is picking up pace. And all these faxes and emails and internet systems is the resultant effect of the short millimeter wave which was discovered by an Indian scientist in India, Jagadish Chandra Bose. There is definite evidence that uh, uh, Bose was uh, very much uh, aware of that. He had actually discovered what we call radios. He had demonstrated that and many people had known about that. The Raman, that he was fascinated always by light and color. And in fact, his Nobel Prize was for his work on light. If you have a light of one color falling on a crystal, for that matter, or any substance, when it's scattered, it may have a color different from the light which was incident. And the difference of the wavelengths, as you say, is a fingerprint of that material. You can identify the material by this so-called Raman shift, the change of color. That is the Raman effect. If you want to see where we have had real great successes, I think those were the areas in which outside help was not easily available. I'm talking of atomic energy. I'm talking of missile technology. I'm talking of space. Despite trade sanctions by developed countries and despite its limited resources, India has a broad-based space program which, in the words of Dr. Vikram Sarabhai, seeks to apply technologies to the real problems of man and society. Dr. Sarabhai, founding chairman of the Indian Space Research Organization, saw India as a nation second to none, a view shared by Prime Ministers Jawaharlal Nehru and Indira Gandhi. Supported by the government, ISRO launched the age of mass communication. Today, India's remote sensing, communications and meteorological satellites have changed life on the subcontinent. It is also one among half a dozen countries that have successfully launched their own satellites. Dr. Sarabhai's dream of Indian society, empowered by information, is more than realized. Radio and television have accessed every corner of the country. Telecommunication networks link the remotest hamlets to the outside world. Meteorological information safeguards the lives of thousands of fisher folk who live along the coast. India's entire space program reaffirms the vitality of Indian science. There is something in the spirit of this land where creativity resides at the grassroots. We have a, move, a lot of movements in the country called people science movements. No other country has these. Now, people science movements means what science people are doing all the time on the one side, and secondly, the science you do should be coupled with people's lives. 1946, Anand, Gujarat. In this sleepy cattle rearing district, farmers from two villages pooled together 247 litres of milk and formed a cooperative. Today, Amul has become a billion litre cooperative giant with two million farmers as members. It has catapulted India to the position of number one producer of milk in the world. The benefits are percolated right down to the people and brought social change and progress in real terms. I would like to see cooperatives really emerge as economic movements. It is a movement uh, of involving our producers into structures which they command. So foreign investment is not entailing a desirable thing. It would have been desirable had India not developed the technology and the competence to manufacture process milk, to manufacture all types of dairy products, which India has done, as you have seen in Anand. The pride in being completely indigenous is justified. 
Amul has become a symbol of self-reliant India. The success of Amul perhaps lies in the fact that its primary motive was the people and not the profit. The focus was on the farmer and the consumer. The company came second. Apart from the packets of processed milk, Amul manufactures a number of byproducts like butter, cheese, yogurt, ice cream and ready-to-eat pizzas. In ancient India, the cow was declared sacred because it provided milk. The childhood exploits of the cowherd god Krishna are filled with stories of his love for butter. Ancient Indian traditions, both cultural and scientific, still inspire modern India. Once they were able to develop high purity iron, they were able to add carbon to that and control the carbon content so that they would get high quality steel. Steel is iron and carbon. India was well known for production of steel. Iron and steel are today the backbone of Indian industry. Established only in 1904, India now has a capacity of making 16.1 million tons of integrated steel, ranking it eighth in the world. At the Bhilai steel plant, red-hot railway tracks snake their way out of furnaces. The rails produced here could run around the world twice. Ispat International, the brainchild of entrepreneur Lakshmi Mittal, has a network of steel-making facilities in seven countries. Used in the automobile and the consumer durable industry, the projected demand for home consumption of steel in the next few years is 42 million tons. The most familiar name on Indian roads is Tata. One can see it on almost every medium and heavy commercial vehicle. Tata Engineering, the flagship company of the Tata Group, is a leading exporter of trucks and buses to West Asia, Africa and Southeast Asia. Tata's passenger vehicles have to compete with names like Toyota, Ford, Mitsubishi and Fiat. But its vehicles have performed well, both in terms of fuel efficiency and market share. This helicopter, taking off from a base in Mumbai, is headed out into the Arabian Sea. 45 kilometers from the shore in the middle of choppy waves and high-speed winds stands a mammoth metal construction, the Bombay High. This offshore oil rig accounts for over 70% of the total production of the Oil and Natural Gas Commission of India. 10,000 kilometers of pipeline wind their way in and around the platform carrying crude oil from the seabed onto the refinery at Uran. A battery of men work round the clock to keep production running. This expertise and technology is now exported to other developing countries. Silk and spice, software and space technology. India has shared whatever it has with the world. It has shared the concept of shunya, zero, nothingness that holds infinity itself within. It has shared a philosophy called science that has through the centuries worked only for the betterment of all life. I would say India's greatest contribution is a philosophy of life exemplified to give it concreteness in the Shanti Mahamantra. If there is one stanza that I'd like all citizens of the world to memorize, meditate upon, it is the Shanti Mahamantra that is the great song of peace. It says Shanti everywhere, not only uh, Prithvi Shanti, Shanti in the earth which, where we live, Antariksha Shanti, Shanti in space, Vanaspataya Shanti, Shanti in the forest, the ecology around us, uh, Aushada Shanti, Shanti in the medicinal herbs, Apaya Shanti, peace in water, let there not be floods uh, which destroy our farms and fields and houses and it ends with Shanti Reva Shanti, peace is the only peace, there is no other mirage that if we win this war there is peace or if we reach this level of per capita income there is peace, it will not come, peace will only come when peace becomes the goal of society and individuals. Mm -hmm.